about uh, cloud systems today. I'm using uh, uh, Golang and JavaScript, so quite an interesting combination. My, uh, my PDF is online here at this URL, so later you could download it. It'll be uh, also shown at the end, a link in my email and such. So um, I was uh, a, a like, uh, system developer doing kernel development, drivers, platforms uh, for like quite a while now. And then more recently been doing uh, silicon design, silicon verification, and um, now um, only the last uh, couple of years doing some front end web um, work. And what I'd say is it's interesting, almost kind of, um, almost quite uh, um, enlightening going from being more like low level than getting uh, in the end like to more um, kind of like high level JavaScript front end systems. Kind of interesting. Often perhaps it could be um, people that are working only at a single layer. So going to talk about um, one of the projects I worked on recently, um, like the last uh, two years. And it's um, going to go through the uh, problem statement, um, different um, ways I could have uh, solved it, and then looking at how I looked at uh, the project design. Going to give a, 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 a de demonstration. Also even um, ha have a look at the code as well and like see how it actually looks, some of the, the kind of core parts of the code. Then also talk about some of the, the limitations. So um, in our company, um, I was working on some um, project to, to expose the silicon chip counters. So typically, silicon chips run at like high frequency. They then have uh, uh, like counters that increment at many megahertz. So how do you, how do you count events? How do you then show that live um, like on like, like, a, like a kind of uh, graphing or like dashboard? So that people can then, uh, then can engineers can then use that, or customers can then use that. How is my uh, my system uh, working? Is it working efficiently? And so, obviously, um, having a lot of data like that, how do you um, I don't know how do you capture it efficiently, and then how do you graph it uh, in real time? So that's really that was the the um, uh, goal here, and then. Of course, having um, like a high rates of data being streamed in real time with reasonably uh, little latency actually presents quite a conflicting um, uh, problem there because it's um, like latency and, and, and volume of data is is you know uh, hundreds of megabytes, and, and of course uh, you want to stream only to, uh, like a matter of kilobytes onto your front end. So um, how do we solve that? Well, obviously, cloud services um, are like the, the uh, future. Uh, and um, like now, trust uh, boundaries are established, and, and security is there. Um, so there's no issues with, with um, pushing this data through onto your, your front end uh, via like a, uh, a like service running in the cloud. So. It's, it's obviously the solution you want. Now, um, in terms of choosing different languages, there's, um, of course, a, new, a few newer languages um, more recently these days. But in the past, you had things like C, which were um, like more mechanical. You had libraries. You had a lot of uh, integration work to do to use these libraries. Um, like C++, you had more uh, layering. Of course, um, perhaps. Java, also like many libraries you can integrate, and, and of course so on. But then as you get uh, to the uh, higher level languages like Python, then you'll end up with, with uh, like slower performance, less scalability, more, 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 more like memory overhead. And so here, of course, um, obviously something is missing here, and of course uh, JavaScript. And so that's, that's one of the key things here. So you can, if you offload a lot of the processing onto the front end, like data reduction or uh, that kind of thing, then of course you can you can uh, have quite a responsive, efficient uh, dashboard or interface. So here, um, the like uh, like Rust uh, um, and of course Go, they're obviously quite quite recent and uh, like the last ten years, and they've been really quite uh, instrumental in changing how you implement. 
or, or giving you the tools um, to then implement uh, like cloud services, web servers, um, and of course have integration across that, that stack. Whereas previously you'd have PHP running under Apache, and then you'd, you'd have other uh, like um, separate middleware running, uh, and so on. So here, of course, with like Go or Rust, you can integrate things, which which are, like makes it much more efficient and easier uh, managing it. So here, um, I chose Go, and then um, let's see. I'd say that there's now uh, like a huge amount of inf uh, information out there. So it's a pretty good choice, pretty well supported, uh, and also you can cross-compile to different architectures. How many people have heard about ARM in the cloud? Exactly, yeah, a few of us, good. And actually half the audience, that's really good. That's the future, and it's happening now. So now you have um, many hosting, uh, many companies making, making chips with um, 80, 64 cores, 128 cores in one single chip. It's going to, going to um, take off in the next few years. Anyway, so uh, of course, one of the key things there is, is with Go, you can very easily cross compile onto ARM. So, um, and, and therefore, you can um, deploy your services efficiently. Now, in terms of the architecture that I used for my uh, application, pretty simply, um, we need some communication between the client and the server, two-way communication, so that the server can, can send data asynchronously back to the client. So because HTTP will only request um, when the client wants, then you need um, a, a, of course, channel back from the server. So we're going to use um, a, a, like, a web sockets for that. So key thing about, uh, of course, like Golang is it's compiled, unlike Python, so it, it's actually quite um, efficient with CPU usage. Easy to integrate um, with different libraries, uh, either from GitLab, uh, sorry, uh, GitHub or like built-in libraries. And um, you have uh, pretty rapid uh, build um, times and, and uh, times to run it. Unlike, for example, if you, if anyone has used a boost, build times can be like many minutes. Um, you have built-in language uh, concurrency, which is really, really nice. And then uh, channels for communicating states and data. And then also it, it has lower, uh, like everything is built into the binary, so you don't have all, all these libraries you've got to ship. And actually, um, in fact, mentioning that, you can, you can have the equivalent of a kind of a um, Dockerized container. If you just if you run this, if if you run your binary, um, and you edit the the uh, the uh, system D file, then you can isolate um, all of the the uh, network namespace, the PID namespace, um, and so on. So so actually, um, you can actually secure and isolate your binary as it's a like single binary. Okay, so here um, of course JavaScript. Obviously, it's really mature, very, very well known, so easy pool of talent available. So very good choice for this, this approach. And then here, um, the key thing, perhaps, when you're, you're, you're um, uh, uh, developing such an application is you then you like map out your protocol. So your messages, um, probably encoded in JSON, um, that happen between the client and the server. Once you've worked out, okay, the, the message flow and all the kind of behavior surrounding that, then you can uh, begin to implement. Here, what it did is, is um, I, I, I like actually have like a, um, like a very simple kind of like a handshake for signing on, uh, like from the clients. Then I um, send state, for example, um, any any um, um, information needed for drawing the UI um, on the clients, and then um, also the client will then ask, okay, I want these events to be shown, and so the, then we'll will then uh, like transmit these events at like regular intervals, and then rendering will occur on the clients. So in terms of the the actual structure of the uh, the code. I, um, it's broken up into different modules in the different files, and we have uh, various threads here. 
So um, the kind of main thing is, is events being read from different sources. In this case, um, we have our silicon chip and also kernel VM counters and also uh, processor counters as well. So we can, um, when we're running like a workload with our, our silicon chip, then you can see, okay, um, what is the kernel doing? Are there page faults? How is the processor call load? That data is then ingested and um, sent, sent to a, a, like, um, a, uh, a file that is mapped in memory uh, so that you have data, uh, like history information and encoded into a, 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 like a fixed uh, binary format so it's efficient. And then that's, that's then sent also um, via JSON to the uh, HTML uh, clients there. Likewise, we have, um, let's see, we have, oh, I'm sorry, um, it's sent via um, the web server uh, threads here, rather. Um, yeah. That's also for static content, so everything is self-hosting. And then we also have a, 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 like, a, like a SSH client so that you can, you can uh, easily, um, in your session, logged into a server, you can monitor uh, these like stats. Um, so like you can very easily see what's happening on a like system here. Okay, so I'll show a live demonstration. All right, so here I'm logged into a system here, um, which has all of these processes. Okay, so here um, I'm running an uh, HTOP here. HTOP shows 144 cores here. So that's um, one of our, like our larger servers with our silicon chips inside. Going to run my Numiscope project, which is there for monitoring uh, the, the, um, uh, the cache coherent events in our chips. So I'll run that. It's now listening here. Not sure if you guys can see that okay. Is that clear? Yeah, oh, good. So uh, better now, right? So um, it's listening now on port 80. I'm forwarding the port um, over SSH, so I can connect from my browser to this this process running here. What's happening is it's now uh, it's now showing live updates from our uh, silicon there, and we can see um, since since um, this is showing. Uh, cache coherent events occurring on, on, on the actual CPU interconnect. It, it's quite uh, hard to explain the meaning of each of the events. But right now we can see there's something like uh, 50,000 uh, occurring like that. And right now there isn't any workload as we can see on HTOP. So we're going to run a benchmark. This is the um, NASA um, NAS parallel benchmarks, which are doing some mathematical operations. And we should see uh, the load here climb significantly. So we have like real time um, graphing here via uh, D3 JS. And yeah. So we can see now actually different, different uh, things happening. We can pause this thing and we can zoom in. And yeah, there's um, 17 million events happening uh, right now. Um, in the meanwhile, this is now updating down here as well, and we can resume the scrolling here. Now, I uh, just want to show you guys, there's um, kernel VM stats here that I'm capturing. This is all done in, in Bootstrap, actually, and actually pretty simple. And um, here I'm showing some interesting VM events, for example, um, how many page faults are happening, which tells you when when there's um, memory allocated and consumed. Also, I can select the, all these different event counters on my silicon chips. So we can get a lot of um, interesting stats from this about our our silicon chip and like if, if for example, it's working as we expect. Um, just finally, uh, we can also um, 
Right now, it, it's, it's averaging these over all of the six servers that we have because our chip um, lets you uh, boot six, uh, like many servers, as one big server. So we have six servers there. I'm going to show you how it looks when I, I disable that averaging, and then um, it's broken down per server. Um, so that, of course, explains why, uh, like, uh, like why there's 144 cores. And then we can see there's there's actually some workload imbalance here. I pause that. We can see the the workload from from this, of course, benchmark um, occurs um, differently on different servers. So on on two servers, it's like two million reads of cache lines a second. And then on four servers, it's only like 30,000. So you can see that this is not utilizing, the benchmark here is not utilizing all, all the service resources efficiently. Yeah. Good. And in fact, I can, I'll go on to show you um, a little bit of the structure of how I serve this, these files, um, the JavaScript, the HTML, and also the, the, um, the actual uh, guideline as well. So, go back to the presentation. Okay, so we'll actually look at uh, some of the code here. We have these different files. Uh, generally, um, it's nice breaking things down into files because then you can manage it. Then the like Git um, history, you can uh, like uh, get log on a certain file, and then it's easier tracking changes. So I have these two files here: interact.js and index.html, which is served by the the built-in uh, GoLang web server. And, and so those are the only only content uh, that is that is served. Um, that means you can actually. You can run this application um, on an internal network, which isn't exposed on the internet. There are no external, um, external uh, kind of like uh, files and resources needed. Then the actual uh, events and the the measurement um, of the the kind of uh, samples is done via these like, these uh, three different files here. So there's the events test file here that then lets me run go test, and then it, it'll run some automatic. Um, uh, verification of of the of uh, different functions, so then it's, it's easier then to to then um, uh, like address bugs and everything. And then here, I have um, a like also my live web web version, and then also like a sampling version which I I can run um, offline, so I can then later save a trace and um, that I can load later. I, I also uh, like showed that as well, and then uh, the top level files here for for the argument handling. So um, I'm going to show you some of the the like cool things here with Go. So here um, in main.go we have the argument handling, very simple, just with with um, um, passing any flags that you pass when you when you run any of the uh, different modes of the binary. So here, um, live is is um, the one that that I was showing there, uh, like for the web uh, interface. Start is is like a um, like a kind of like a like a client version which shows you um, on the terminal information, and then of course record, record then gives you the um, like captures uh, like all those starts onto disk, so later you can load them. Here we have the function which then starts the, the HTTP server. In effect, um, all it's doing is calling HTTP.fileserver and then on, um, on a certain directory and saying if, if the client accesses slash monitor, then call function monitor. Monitor um, then will handle um, uh, WebSockets. And then, and then it go here, this like prefix go, then makes this function HTTP listen and serve makes that one asynchronous, so it's now serving HTTP requests. So here, monitor is used for handling 
incoming connections for um, the uh, JSON WebSocket. And then it reads, uh, reads the, um, a, uh, like a, a, any kind of message that was written down it, and then compares the string. If it matches the, the secret key, then it'll uh, kind of fall through. And if not, then it'll just terminate, uh, like terminate uh, that connection. After that, then it'll send down a bit of state here in uh, like a, a, a map that's produced um, of events. So then um, the UI can then build those um, lists of events. So onto the the connect uh, the sampling of the the uh, events here. So how do we actually how do we access the um, the registers on silicon chips. Well, what we do is we call, we open devmem, and then we, we mmap devmem. mmap will, will um, let you access from your application, like from an array, your, uh, any, re um, any silicon registers, sorry, any registers in your, in your silicon. It could be um, in any part of the system. And so you then cast this to an array in Go, um, which is uh, can be considered unsafe because then you can you can access registers you're not meant to, and then it like checks is this really our chip? Does the vendor and um, like device ID match? And then after that, it simply will uh, like access um, some of the registers here, uh, and then and then later on, um, it's then able uh, then then uh, to uh, to actually sample the the events by accessing this array later in like stack control and then um, looking at the elapsed the, the number of cycles elapsed since it like last sampled and then reading out each of the each of the events um, of interest and then um, and normalizing that like by the clock speed like those samples uh, of course then are passed back um, and marshaled back to the client. And so, so then, um, what are the issues um, that uh, actually that you found? Well, if you're if you're like sending data at like say a thousand hertz um, via a socket back to the client, then it's a lot of uh, congestion. I mean, it, it isn't efficiently packed in JSON. Also, when the the like JavaScript then is passing it, it's it's like um, um, like doing only like uh, like very very small loops. So it's uh, like doing a lot of work for little data. So batching. So uh, batching the the actual uh, these events um, into uh, like blocks really helps. Obviously, like they are time stamped, and and then um, when actually when the graph is drawn, then um, you like scroll it at like at a, like a, a like a lower frequency, and then it's 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 definitely smooth enough, but also it like, isn't being. Uh, like drawn a thousand times, uh, like at like a thousand hertz. Also, um, clearly, like choosing, uh, like choosing, uh, like a library that will be efficient for graphing. So uh, D3JS is is quite mature. Um, some of the other ones are, are aren't as uh, like mature and therefore cannot handle millions of points. And then also in the future, um, one thing I have to to also implement is is. A loading, um, loading in like blocks because um, if I like load like a uh, like a really large trace file, it'll it'll like jam the the kind of main loop for like for many many seconds, and then um, it will block the the rendering thread. In fact, I'll just show you the loading uh, traces here. So here we can we can simply just access uh, here. I have some traces here. Actually, this one is okay. Anyway, this one um, has an issue, but then also we summarize various uh, stats as well, so we can see how many events occurred, and also um, like the rate of events. And then normally you'd you'd be able to zoom around here and activate it and, and uh, deactivate different different traces here. And here, all of the events are captured so um, uh, on the chip, so then you can really figure out what you want to see. 
Uh, yeah. Plus, when I'm in live mode, you can vary the, the uh, sample rate uh, uh, on the slider here. And that's why, that's why when you're sampling um, at like high frequency, like every, say, like a few milliseconds, then you really, really must batch the updates. Finally, I'll demonstrate the, uh, the actual CLI-based output, because um, that's, of course, quite useful as well. So here, um, it's now running like a, a, a default set of um, events here. So page false at the end here shows you how many um, like pages are being, being uh, used by the kernel um, across all, all applications running. And then here, these, these events here, these N2 victim blocks uh, sent and, uh, and so on, these are all cache coherent uh, events. So if I run my workload, then we'll see uh, definitely those are going to spike. Let's just resize this. There we go. Yeah, so we can see that they went from like, say, uh, 50,000 now to like 1.3 million, 2 million, that kind of thing. So, yeah. And finally, I can actually record this for later collect, uh, like, like for later analysis. So I'll just do a, a quick capture, and then I'll load that into the UI, and you can see. Okay, I've copied it across, now I can just load it. Let's, let's see what's going on. Okay, so here now we can analyze the, the events that, that have occurred here. And um, here I can average across all servers, and if I load that again, it will yeah, make it easier. Okay, good, so here we can see it's uh, like something interesting here. Um, so the number of wait cycles, if I zoom in a bit. Yeah, so we can see that actually, um, uh, on average, there was probably about 80% per server um, waiting for our interconnect um, for resources. So in this case, we can see during this, uh, this like time period, during um, this benchmark, our interconnect is slow, uh, and blocking, uh, like uh, reducing the throughput of the the execution. Good. So that wraps it up. This is all published on GitHub, so, uh, with, along with the history uh, here. So I show you that. Yep, and, and this has all, all, also all the documentation here as well. And then you can, you can of course clone it and then build it, something like that. And then uh, you have to run it as root because it, it accesses and maps the chip counters. And then it also it tells you how to run it. So, very good. Thank you, uh, thank you guys. <laughs>